The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome tonight to Getting Better Sleep as a Caregiver webinar. I'm so glad you took the time to join us. I'm Janet Edmondson, and I'll be presenting this webinar. And just so you know, it's probably going to go about 40 minutes or so, so you can budget your time. But you, if you can't stay for the whole time, we do have a recording coming out uh, with the follow-up emails. So as people are still arriving, um, I want to remind you of my next webinar on February 9th. So put that on your calendar. The topic is how to boost your immunity and your immune system. Watch for the link in the follow-up email that you're going to get to us hopefully uh, tomorrow or within uh, one or two days. After you register, you'll get the link to the recording after the webinar is over, just like you will with this one. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that my books and other products are available on my website at www.affirmyourself.com, or you can order them from Amazon or your local bookstore. If you're interested in the audiobook, I just want to make you uh, sure that you note that when you're searching for it in Amazon, you need to type in MP3 with the book title, Finding Me with Charles, to get to the audiobook. And the audiobook has been recorded by myself. And one last administrative item um, to ask me a question, just type it in the question box, which is in the panel to your right, and then hit send. And you can do this anytime during the webinar, and I am going to be here to, uh, to help answer uh, those questions at the end of the webinar. Let me now quickly tell you a little bit about my background. From a career standpoint, I have a master's of education degree from Georgia State University and over 30 years experience in leadership within the worksite health promotion field. I've been a public speaker and trainer since 2007. If you participated in our webinars before, you know that I took care of my husband, Charles, during the five years he faced a movement disorder with dementia or co other cognitive losses. The autopsy confirmed that he had CBD, which stands for cortical basal degeneration, an atypical Parkinsonian disease. He died at the age of 50 in the year 2000. I am also a past chair of the board of directors for Cure PSP. PSP is a cousin disease to CBD, another atypical Parkinsonian disease. And I've been a support group leader for two online groups and one face-to-face -face group for a number of years, over 10 years. And I currently live in South Portland, Maine. So let's get started. Let's look at this quote from John Steinbeck. Quote, it is a common experience that a problem difficult at night is resolved in the morning after the committee of sleep has worked on it, end quote. I sound like chipmunk someone is saying, is that correct for others? Is it not coming out clearly for others? Could people type something in the question box before I go on? I can get a headset if I need to. Anyone else can clear? Okay. Uh, it might just be your uh, particular, you sound fine. Okay, good. I'm going to continue on. Sorry about that. Thank you, everybody. So anyway, going back to uh, John Steinbeck's quote, I, this is the wonderful benefit, right, of a good night's sleep to get all those worries figured out. All right. Many people are experiencing additional disruptions with sleep due to the coronavirus. For me, I struggled to fall back to sleep one night early in the pandemic when I was worried about whether we would get our mom out of, our, out of the independent retirement community she was in. And I had another sleep deprived night again early in the pandemic when I learned that my sister and my niece in South Carolina, both nurses, were going to be treating COVID-19 patients without ideal PPE. And I imagine many of you could be struggling with sleep just due the, to the fears that your loved one or yourself might get COVID or just you know, the disruption that we have in life is normal. We have to wear masks. We, you know, we stay in far apart. We're not seeing the people that uh, as much as we need to that uplift us. 
we can't don't do a lot of hugging. There's a lot of things in the economy too. Yes, this is the, do you all see the video? You should be seeing my screen as well. Someone's asking, are you seeing the slides as well? Could people please respond to that? They should be seeing the slides as well as uh, hearing me. Okay, thank you. And I imagine many of you could uh, be struggling with sleep uh, for many other reasons as well, but certainly the coronavirus is part of it. I wanted to tell you <clears throat> a little bit about uh, my difficulties in getting enough sleep when Charles was going through his disease. So <clears throat> first of all, oh, about a year or so, his disease lasted for about five years before he died. And I would say within the first year or two, he was waking up every hour on the hour, um, whether it was uncomfortable or he, um, with his disease, he felt like he always had to go to the bathroom. Um, so some of you that don't have audio, you'll need to look at your microphone and make sure that your speakers are turned up. I do have people saying that they are getting the audio, so I do believe the audio is working. So if you don't have it, try to uh, turn up your speakers. Actually, you probably can't hear that, but I don't have a way to tell you that here. Let me just see if I can tell you that here. Uh, sorry, folks, let me just take a moment. I'll just say turn speakers on. Let's get that going out to everybody. Okay, so continue with my story. Um, I didn't have a really good solution. So, um, and, and when Charles was waking me up so frequently, I was really struggling to fall back asleep. Now, Charles was dealing with this when he was in his late forties, as was I. So he was still working. I was still working initially. Uh, he was working initially and then retired. I was working throughout the whole time. So I was going to work. I had a schedule to keep as well as caring for Charles and a lot on my mind. So um, I couldn't go back to sleep every time that he would wake me up. I finally resorted to, um, to Benadryl with Tylenol, it, uh, through Tylenol PM just to be able to fall back to sleep. And now I'm hearing <clears throat> that uh, Benadryl is not really a great solution. I get for a short term, it's fine, but to have used it all the time is probably not so good. Um, I'll tell you more about that later. <clears throat> then eventually, because Charles would be jerking and moving around in bed, um, I ended up uh, sleeping on the floor next to the bed because Charles would lash out and say, you don't want to sleep with me anymore. And, and I do. I did. But I couldn't. <laughs> it wasn't possible. So after he fell asleep, I'd roll onto the floor and sleep. And when my mother visited one time, she said, Janet, you could at least put a cushion over there <laughs> so that you have something to sleep on, which I did. And eventually I got an arrow bed. Uh, I didn't start getting good sleep until Charles was on um, Seroquel. He had tried all other kinds of antidepressants and sleep meds and nothing worked until we finally got him on Seroquel. And then we had hospice, which um, gave him a um, we had hospice for the last year of his life. They gave us a hospital bed. And then I knew he was safe because they have the railings and I then could move to the aero bed down. Um, we were in like a little suite in my house, which had the, the living room, the bathroom, and then another room attached. So it was all kind of one little section. So I just moved down the hallway and finally was able on my little aero bed on the floor, able to get some good sleep. But like Charles, your loved one may have sleep issues that are affecting your sleep. We're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. All right. The benefits of sleep. There's some really great benefits to getting a good night's sleep. I don't want you to feel bad if you're struggling with sleep that you're not getting all these, but I do want you to have something to look forward to. So it washes away toxins. It fortifies the immune system. It's like an anti-inflammatory. It's like nature's uh, Advil for us. Um, when we don't have enough sleep, we have a decrease in our killer T cells. These are the things that fight invaders like bacteria and viruses. In fact, without sleep, they decrease by 70%. So just think about that. Uh, sleep helps us to uh, lay down uh, memories. 
and it cements learning while also increasing creativity and insights. You know, you've heard about sleep on a, pro on a problem and, and kind of like what John Steinbeck said that we read in the beginning, the committee of sleep is going to solve your problem overnight. It releases uh, growth hormones. That's when you get that happening. Um, it repairs cells and tissues when we're sleeping well and allows the brain to recover from the day's work. So sleep, sleep actually affects almost every bodily system. What sleep issues do you have? I mean, it, our sleep issues can be in many different areas. Trouble falling asleep, trouble getting enough sleep, trouble staying asleep through the middle of the night, uh, maybe a possible sleep disorder, and it could be any other issue that pops up that impacts sleep. So what are the signs that you are sleep deprived? Well, this, these will show that you're not getting enough quality sleep. One, taking longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep. Two, awakening frequently during the night and not being able to get back to sleep. Now, it might not be all of these. It might just be one of these, but these are the signs. Uh, three, waking up feeling groggy. Four, having trouble staying awake during non-stimulating events. And five, having difficulty remembering things. So these are all the signs that you know, oh gosh, I have got to figure out how to get better sleep. So what gets in the way of a good night's sleep? Well, stress, of course, and we're all facing it. Every single caregiver on this line is facing stress. Or if you're on the line and you have a, have a, a disease, you are facing stress. It goes with the territory. That's going to impact having a good night's sleep. Um, for the caregiver, worrying about your loved one's disease, just that worry, or worry about anything, but certainly the fact that you've got uh, someone who's got a, a medical condition. Family dynamics, you know, if there's tension in the house, you've got a lot of little kids, or you have elderly parents with you, or just uh, things are not going well between people in the house, that will keep you up at night. Uh, staying up too late will impact our sleep. So, um, that's sometimes due to so much to do during the day. Uh, it's hard to get to bed at a decent hour, but it's something we need to think about. Uh, stimulants like caffeine and nicotine too late in the day. Um, uh, alcohol um, that is a sedative, it fragments sleep and blocks dream sleep. Pain. I know every now and then I'm, I'm quite active and uh, sometimes if I don't stretch enough or I do too much one day, I'll wake up in the middle of the night with a hip hurting or a knee hurting and I've got to roll over and uh, get into a comfortable position. So that can do it too. Um, and then it could be your loved one fidgeting. Um, it could be incontinence with your loved one like I had with Charles. So what I let me just tell you my tip if you're having the incontinence issue that uh, is how we dealt with it initially for about a year or so uh, when this was a problem at night uh, I put a condom catheter on Charles he hated it though and it wasn't until he was in the hospital that I saw what the hospital people did and then we replicated that when we got home which is a heavy duty depends pad with a couple of insert pads uh, two to be exact, insert pads, and then a pad on the bed underneath uh, underneath him. And so that meant uh, he was going to urinate in those pads. And in the morning, we'd have to you know, clean all that up. Uh, but he liked that so much better than the condom catheter. But I know people now using condom catheters, and it works great. So there are ways uh, so that you don't have to get up to go to the bathroom. And also, um, if they if you're not to that point, just having a commode, bedside commode can help. So you don't have to walk them all the way into the bathroom and back. I can make it a little less intense. Medications uh, can sometimes cause sleep problems. And then if you or your loved one has a sleep disorder, such as um, REM uh, sleep disorder, which we'll talk about later, or um, um, apnea, sleep apnea, or something like that. And of course, it could be a numerous other things that could be getting in the way of your sleep, everything specific to you. I think it's important.
important to understand the stages of sleep. So I hope you'll bear with me as I try to describe these. Just for the fact that we understand how this is how this is going on each night and when we wake up and things like that, we're going to have a better sense of, you know, the cycles of how sleep goes. So let's start when we are awake. When someone is awake, their brain is occupied with many functions. The pattern seen on an EEG, which is where we can look at the wave action during the waking period are chaotic meaning that different patterns are occurring independently. During waking, breathing is irregular, and there is typically a lot of muscle and eye movement activity. So just think about as you're getting ready for bed or even during the day, just how much activity your brain has. That's wake. Now let's look at stage one. So there are basically two types of sleep. You probably have heard of rapid eye movement, REM sleep. And then there's non-REM sleep. And the non-REM sleep has three different stages. Each is linked to specific brain waves and neural, um, neuronal activity. So sleep is not uniform. So instead, over the course of the night, your total sleep is made up of several rounds of the sleep cycle. All right, so you've got several sleep cycles going on throughout the night. Each round, is composed of four individual stages. In a typical night, a person goes through four to six sleep cycles, all right? Not all sleep cycles are the same length. And on average, though, they're about 90 minutes. So that's the key number to think about. Each sleep cycle is about 90 minutes. And then you have you know, four to six of those a night, depending on how long you're sleeping. So now let's look at what's inside a sleep cycle, that 90 minute period. How much time is spent in each stage? Now we're gonna talk about the stages which are within one period, um, one cycle. The percent of healing sleep gets larger as sleep goes on. So we get more of the healing power the longer we sleep and we get those second and third cycles. Stage one, would be considered light sleep. That's, we're calling it drowsy. So when you first put your head on the pillow, it is non-REM sleep taking you from wakefulness to sleep. During the short period lasting several minutes, your heartbeat, breathing, and eye movement slows, so everything's slowing down, your muscles relax with occasional twitches. Your brain waves begin to slow from their daytime wakefulness chaotic patterns. You're also less aware of your surroundings than during the waking stage, but are easily aroused back to full wakefulness. So you can easily get uh, woken back up at this stage. Stage one accounts for a relatively small percentage of total sleep time, about 5% in healthy adults of your total sleep time a night. That's stage one. That's just a few minutes as we get drowsy. Stage two in the cycle, <clears throat> You are even less aware of your surroundings, but are still easily aroused. During this stage, your heart rate slows, breathing becomes slower and even more regular, and your body temperature decreases. So this is why sleeping in a cool room is so helpful. That's what your body likes. It's already decreasing its temperature, and your muscles relax further. You spend about half of your repeated sleep cycles in stage two. So stage two is about half of each cycle. That is stage two, more subdued. Stage three is a deep restorative sleep. This is, this, this is a stage we really want to make sure we get into, most of which occurs in the first half of the sleep period. This is why brain activity shows slower, more regular patterns. Muscles relax further and breathing is very regular, blood pressure lowers, tissue growth and repair occurs. So let me tell you all the good things that's happening here. We're repairing our tissues, we're growing, um, energy is restored, muscle development occurs, and hormones are released for growth and development. So you see how important all this is. In stage three, we may also bolster the immune system 
and other key bodily processes. So there's that immune system piece. Even though brain activity is reduced, there is evidence that deep sleep contributes to insightful thinking, creativity, and memory. So all of this, you know, getting the ahas in the middle of sleep can happen in this stage. This is the stage of sleep that is needed for you to feel refreshed in the morning. If someone wakes you up during this stage, you may be groggy and confused. Back when those telephones used to ring right in the middle of the night, if you caught you in this stage, ugh, that's awful. And then the last stage we're going to call REM sleep. That's a rapid eye movement. And this is when you dream. Your arm and leg muscles become temporarily paralyzed, which prevents you from acting out your dreams, unless you have a disorder with that. Darting eye movements begin, which is how they got the name of this. Heart rate and blood pressure actually rise. REM sleep is believed to be essential to cognitive functions. Those are all of our thinking functions like memory, learning, and creativity. So stage three and REM sleep are very important in regard to laying down our memories. Under normal circumstances, you don't enter a REM sleep stage until you've been asleep for about 90 minutes. But as the night goes on, the REM stages get longer within each cycle. So this, they're not very long in that first cycle, but they get longer in the second cycle, longer in the third cycle, etc. So um, if you're not getting that last hour or two of sleep that you need, look what you're missing, right? While the first REM stage may last only a few minutes in that first cycle, later stages can last around an hour. You'll be an hour in that uh, dream stage. In total, REM stages make up about 25% of sleep in adults. All right, thank you for bearing with me on the stages, because I think it's just important to know how much restorative stuff is happening when you sleep through these stages and how the stages cycle around. So the problem we don't have enough sleep, one thing is it impacts your ability to focus and make decisions. So cutting back by even one hour of sleep a night can make it tough to focus the next day and can slow your response time. Studies also find that when you lack sleep, you are more likely to make bad decisions and take more risk. This is not good for a care partner, right? Being sleep deprived also puts us at a greater risk for a car crash. Even one night with only a few hours of sleep can impair concentration, coordination, productivity, judgment, and emotional stability. No wonder we get grouchy, right, when we don't get enough sleep. These consequences are not good for those of us performing the caregiver role. When we don't have enough sleep, it affects our mood. Insufficient sleep can make you irritable and is linked to poor behavior and trouble with relationships. We are not just our, you know, we're just not our best selves when we lack sleep. People who chronically lack sleep are also more likely to become depressed. Like I said, I get grouchy uh, when I don't have enough sleep. And when we don't get enough sleep, it negatively affects our health. Studies have strongly linked poor sleep to increased risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, strokes, and other medical conditions. It also impacts one's ability to manage these medical conditions if we've got them. And it also puts the immune system at risk. This is not a good time during COVID for, to have our immune system at risk. Just one week of poor sleep can lower resistance to infections and impair wound healing. There's accumulating evidence linking poor sleep to increased calorie intake, weight gain, and obesity. So gosh, this is an important issue and I'm glad you all are on tonight to be able to look into this. So how much sleep do we need? Enough sleep is whatever makes you feel refreshed and alert the next day. So that's bottom line. According to the National Institutes of Health, most adults need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And this changes as you age. After age 60, nighttime sleep tends to be shorter, lighter, 
and interrupted by multiple awakenings. So let me let me talk a little bit about awakening at night and what's good and what's bad. So apparently it's normal to wake up one to two times a night. But when it's four or more awakenings a night, that's probably insomnia and is bad for health. Another thing to think about as you think about how much sleep you need is also follow your biological clock, also known as circadian rhythms. Some of us do best at night. We're the night owls. Others are better in the morning. We're morning people. Also, habit has a lot to do with the sleep and wake cycles. Just think about this way. Your body likes normalcy, things to be stable and normal so that you would fall asleep the same time every night and wake up the same time every morning. When that's your cycle, your body likes that. Many people feel they can catch up on missed sleep during the weekend, but depending on how sleep deprived you are, that may not be adequate enough. Doesn't always work that way. So here are some signs that we are getting quality sleep. According to the University of California Berkeley Wellness Letter, uh, who reported on results from an expert panel commissioned in 2017 by the National Sleep Foundation, signs of good quality sleep inclu include falling asleep within 30 minutes of going to bed. That's a good sign if that happens for you. Sleeping at least 85% of the time spent in bed. Waking no more than once or twice per night for no longer than five minutes at a time and being awake for less than a total of 20 minutes after initially falling asleep. With older people, it's okay to take longer to fall asleep. It can take up to 60 minutes and wake up more often, totaling up to 30 minutes after initially falling asleep. So they understand as we age that uh, this gets stretched a little bit. Now let's go to some of the solutions. <laughs> Enough of, the, of how this can impact us good and bad, let's find out what we can do about it. The, we're gonna have a slide and, and discussion on each one of these points. So we're gonna take them one at a time, how we can foster better sleep. First is your sleep schedule. Taking control of your sleep schedule is the first step in getting better sleep. Your body likes a routine and regularity, as I've already mentioned, and that goes for your sleep. Now, you also need to get your loved one on a sleep schedule as well, as best you can, both of you. So set a regular time to go to bed and to wake up and then stick with it, even on weekends and when you're sleep deprived. Prioritize time for sleep. See, you're not going to get enough sleep unless you prioritize it because there's always something to get in the way. So you just have to make it just as important as everything else in your life, as eating, as exercising, as uh, shopping and that sort of thing. So if you want to make sure that you're getting the recommended amount of sleep each night, you need to build that time into your schedule. What will you cut short? What will you delegate? or not do to keep to your planned sleep time. Again, I know this is very hard for care partners. Um, our time is often not our own, but if we can try to make a plan and schedule, it will be better. And then be careful with naps. Uh, naps are okay, but if you nap for too long or too late in the day, it can throw off your sleep schedule and make it harder to get to sleep when you want to. The best time they say to nap is shortly after lunch in the early afternoon. Uh, and the best length of time for a nap is about 20 minutes. And again, this all goes for your loved one as well. So 20 minutes sometime after the lunch hour, if you can, for naps. Now create a, conclus a conducive sleep environment. So here are some ways to do that. The sleep environment is huge on the quality, getting the right quality of sleep. Eliminate noise. So try earplugs if you've got a noisy breather for your uh, sleep partner. You can get a white noise machine. Go on Amazon, you can find it. You can turn a fan on to create some white noise. 
or you can get an app. I have downloaded on my phone, it's called Noise Box. So again, if you're hearing noises from outside or from your care partner or something else, try um, some white noise machines or some of these apps to so that you can't hear that. Uh, in regard to the environment, eliminate light. Keep your bedroom as dark as you can. And you know, it may make sense if you've got the funds to install darker shades. Some of those, you know, block all the light out shades. It will really help you sleep better. You can also sleep with an eye mask. Um, turn lights on the clocks away. Get your tech out of the bedroom because the blue light decreases the melatonin. And we're going to talk about this later, but melatonin helps time our sleep so we can fall asleep. So you don't want those blue lights going when you're getting ready for sleep because it's going to keep the melatonin from coming and keep you from being able to fall asleep. And I would encourage everybody to buy a motion detector nightlight. If you don't have them, get, you get it on Amazon or your local hardware store, a motion detector light. What's great about that is as soon as you put a foot down off your bed, depending on where that light is, it's going to turn the light on. You can have it in the bathroom. So it'll come on when you walk in the bathroom. However, the great part is once you get back to bed, it'll be on only for a few more seconds and then it will go off. So you don't have that night light still shining all night. As we said, keep the bedroom cool. Most people sleep better when the room is cool. Just have an extra blanket if you get cold later in the night. And then use the bed only for sleep and of course for sex also. You should associate your bed with sleep. So if you're only sleeping in it, when you get to the bed, your body, your brain's going to say, oh, this is sleep time. Um, also, your bed linens and pillow and mattress, that all should be comfortable. So that's the sleep environment. You got a lot of control over that. Now let's look at how we can foster pro sleep habits during the day. There's a lot we can do during the day to make us help us sleep better at night. The first thing is get daylight. Natural sleep wake cycle is regulated by light and darkness. Think about the caveman times, right? When it turned dark, they'd sleep. When it turned light, they'd wake. Now we've got lights on in the house and lights on in the streets. It, our body's all confused. So if you can get daylight during the day, that'll help uh, turn you off to be able to sleep at night. So our internal clocks are regulated by light exposure. I mentioned melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that helps you fall asleep. However, for melatonin to work well at night, you need to get enough daylight during the day. All of this is what uh, tells the melatonin what to do. So try to get outside in natural sunlight, or if you can't and you can't get your loved one out, open the window, uh, the shades of the window and the blinds, so you get that natural light at least 30 minutes each day. Longer the better. If natural light isn't an option for you, call your doctor and ask about a light therapy box. Um, and uh, Again, enough daylight is very important for your loved one as well. If they're struggling with sleep, it might be because they're inside all the time and never getting that daylight. Um, now, I will say the light therapy box isn't for everybody, so do talk to your doctor about that. And then move daily. Exercising regularly can improve sleep, especially if you are older. Most experts advise against intense exercise close to bedtime because it can hinder your body's ability to settle down before you sleep. But getting exercise during the day, you and your loved one, whatever you can do, will help with sleep. Monitor stimulants. So we talked about caffeine and nicotine. They're both stimulants. Keep an eye on your caffeine intake and avoid it later in the day when it can be a barrier to falling asleep. The same with nicotine. Be mindful of your alcohol. So alcohol can help you fall asleep quickly and deepens sleep initially, but later disrupts it. It inhibits you from getting into REM sleep. 
So consider avoiding it as a nightcap before bed. Enjoy it maybe during dinner, but don't get it too close to sleep time. Don't eat too late. We all know that, right? It's hard to fall asleep when you've got a full stomach. So don't eat a large meal two to three hours before bedtime and minimize fatty and spicy foods. Those are the ones that can really interfere with a good night's sleep. If you need an evening snack, make it something kind of healthy and light. Drink less liquid, just liquid in general after dinner so that the need to urinate won't keep waking you up. So I try to stop drinking liquids after about eight o'clock in the evening. And then that way I've been able to eliminate the number of times I wake up at night uh, to go to the bathroom. And then use stress management techniques. So worry can be a big source of stress as we mentioned and therefore sleep problems. Practice stress management techniques during the day to minimize the stress effects at night. Deep breaths, jotting down your worries. I have a little post-it notes next to my bed. Talking to a trusted friend. Do something you enjoy during the day and seek professional help when it's needed, whether it's your doctor or a counselor or someone. Now, having a good pre-bedtime routine is another thing that can help you sleep better, at least help you fall asleep. So if you have a hard time falling asleep, it's natural to think that the problem starts when you lie down in bed. In reality though, the lead up to bedtime plays a crucial role in preparing you to fall asleep quickly and effortlessly. As much as possible, try to create a consistent routine. Think about creating a routine that you can follow every night because this helps reinforce healthy habits and it signals uh, your body and your mind that bedtime is approaching. As part of the routine, here's some uh, important things to think about to incorporate. Wind down for at least 30 minutes. So plan to be in that wind down mode 30 minutes before bed. So relax and try to retreat from your problems before you go to bed. You can try read, you know, read a book, listen to music, do some relaxation exercises, do a hobby, knit, do a you know, jigsaw puzzle, meditate. There are actually apps that, can, that you can use uh, some free ones that will help calm you down. One is called Calm. The other is called Headspace. There are many others, but those two are uh, ones that a lot of people use. So you can use that and put that part of your wind down routine. Um, anything that you find soothing. Then lo start lowering the lights. Afford, af uh, I'm sorry, avoid bright lights so that you can tr transition to bedtime and start contributing to your body's production of melatonin. So we need melatonin, we need daylight during the day and not a lot of light at night for that melatonin to come up and work effectively. And of course, disconnect from devices. If you're like this woman and in bed work, working on your phone, that is totally uh, messing with you. Tablets, cell phones, laptops, even flat screen TVs, can keep your brain wired, making it hard to truly wind down. As much as possible, try to disconnect for those 30 minutes in advance of going to bed. And if you have to use a device close to bedtime, some devices have a night mode, so try that. Well, if you can't fall or stay asleep, here are some things that I use that seem to help. And these are things I picked up I just love this picture, by the way. It just makes me smile. Um, first of all, write things down. Like I said, I keep a post-it pad next to my nightstand with a pen. So if I get a to-do that I need to do or a solution to a problem or whatever, I write it down. And what that does is it gets that thing out of my head and onto the paper so it doesn't swim around there all night and keep me awake worrying about it. Try relaxation techniques. We said this a couple of times, but now that you're trying to fall asleep and you can't, um, take those deep breaths, really deep breaths. It forces your blood pressure to relax, slow down, and the heart rate to slow down. So just take those deep breaths. You can uh, count down from 10. You can do progressive muscle relaxation, which is 
you start at your toes, you, you tighten muscles with your inhale, and then relax with your exhale, then you work up to your calves, tighten, inhale, relax, exhale, and work all the way up your body carefully. Um, and every time you let, every time you exhale, you just totally let that muscle relax. That's another way to, uh, another relaxation technique you can try. And there's all kinds of counting, uh, deep breaths and counting. In four, hold for a few, and then out for four, uh, all kinds of combinations. But here's, uh, distracting your brain, that third tip, is the one I have found to work the best for me. So a friend just told me about a year ago about something her doctor told her to do, and oh, or her therapist, somebody. And let me tell you, it has really been working for me. I'd say 80, 90% of the time. What you do is you get comfortable, you relax, you take some of those deep breaths to get your body totally relaxed, and then you say, stop thinking on your in and out breaths. So I do, as I inhale, I say, stop thinking. As I exhale, I say, stop thinking. I'm not verbally saying, I'm saying it in my head. Over and over, and I don't stop until I'm out. So in stop thinking, breathe out, stop thinking, breathe in, stop thinking, breathe out, say stop thinking. And focus on that. And before you know it, you're out. I think there's something, you know, because what, what's happening is we're thinking, which is keeping our brain awake. And this is telling our brain, don't think. I have another mantra I've used. I'm a public speaker. So when I've got uh, a heavy schedule, uh, and I know it's going to be tight for me to get prepared for speaking um, at night. If that's keeping me awake, I have a little mantra I say. On my in-breath, I say, I will get it done. And on my out-breath, I say, and it will be fun. I will get it done, and it will be fun. I repeat it over and over with my in and out-breath. So I say that to you, not that that particular man mantra will work for you, but you might be able to think of one where you say something on your in-breath and something on your out-breath that will help you. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe I will get it done and it will be fun. It is actually good for caregivers now that I think about it. One more thing with this technique, take consciously take your tongue off the roof of your mouth. When you're awake, before you sleep, your tongue is on the roof of your mouth. When you fall asleep, it relaxes. So go ahead and get it off the roof of your mouth. That will start the relaxation. Another way to distract yourself, which I sometimes do and, and can help, is sing lyrics to a song. So maybe you know the old words, all the Beatles songs or hymns or Christmas carols. Um, by focusing on those words, and you can actually kind of sing it in your brain, uh, that's the distraction that can then help you sleep. If nothing's working and you're still lying there, um, what I use, I, I get up and read for a little bit. So I have a little reading light, a little night light for my book. And if I've, if I've been laying there for a while, I'll actually take some time and read till my brain. And I don't read something stimulate. I read something light until my brain um, gets distracted and I can fall asleep again. There's another technique I've never tried. I think it's more something that a counselor could help you with called cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and this replaces anxiety related to poor sleep with positive thoughts that associate with being in bed with uh, being asleep. So it ties bed sleep together. So when you hit the bed, you sleep. So there's a, some therapy you can get for that. And I encourage you to try that. If all these other techniques are not working for you, if you're doing everything, the pre-work, the day uh, during the day and at night, uh, you're still struggling with sleep, uh, talk to your therapist, talk to your therapist, talk to your uh, doctor, and see if you might be able to find someone who can help you with cognitive behavioral therapy for sleeping. It can be more effective than sleep medications and certainly safer for you. So do ask about it. If you really can't sleep, about 20 minutes, time to get out of bed, do something relaxing until you can go back and go to sleep. And 
Finally, make sure your pets are not disturbing your sleep. So experiment with these. You may find that one thing works, the others don't. Not everything will work for everybody. This is what's been working for me and things that I've learned from experts along the way. Now, what about when your loved one is affecting your sleep? We've already alluded to this. Some of you, like I did, may be struggling getting a good night's sleep because of your loved one's disease or their struggle with sleep. Some neurological diseases cause, cause jerks and unaware moments and movements. Um, with other diseases, the brain doesn't paralyze the limbs during dreams and your loved one will act those out at night and will kick you or hit you. Others, the um, person may wake up frequently, just need to go to the bathroom as we talked about, and some might have sleep apnea where they hold their breath at night because their mechanism is, sh is, is shut off, which is very loud snoring and certainly not helpful for anybody. So here's some suggestions if you're into this situation. And these, these will work for all of us, right? Turn the TV off early. You know, have them read if they can still read or do something to relax their mind, just as we've talked about you guys, you doing for yourself. Again, get them some daylight and exercise, whatever they can do, even if it's not much. Restrict drinking like we talked uh, earlier in the evening, especially caffeine, uh, things with caffeine and, and that are colas and coffee type stuff. And keep that schedule, that wake and sleep schedule. And consider separate beds or separate rooms. Um, I, I didn't do this till later in uh, Charles's disease, but I know that some who, uh, who do this use baby monitors. So they're able to hear um, if their loved one wakes up. So you don't have to be worried about that. Remain calm if you need to help them at night. You're going to probably be all charged up and kind of mad, but try to remain calm because that will allow them to get back to sleep easier and certainly will allow you to as well. Check their medications for side effects. Insomnia may be one of the side effects of the meds, and then you can talk to the doctor and maybe come up with um, an alternative that doesn't have that same effect. And make sure to talk to their doctor for advice. Uh, don't continue to go without sleep. Uh, keep trying, keep experimenting. Oftentimes an antidepressant is what may just do the trick or some other kind of sleep aid for your loved one. I do want to talk about caution with medications for you um, and, your, and your loved one. So other meds like some Parkinson's meds can interfere with sleep. So ask your doctor about those. Um, antidepressants could help with sleep. But now let's look at some other sleep medications. Sleep medications often sedate us and that does not put us into a good sleep cycle. So remember that when you're taking meds to get your sleep. There is an increase of death and cancer from sleeping pills, so that's not good. And I mentioned even Benadryl, what I've learned over the years is I used to think I was told by a doctor, oh, no big deal, don't worry about taking it. But now we're learning that Benadryl dehydrates us and when we dehydrate, our brain doesn't work all that well. Um, so memory and focusing and stuff doesn't uh, suit us very well. Ambien. I remember when Ambien came out and they were touting it as a very safe, um, once you wake up, you're totally awake, it's a very safe drug. Well, over the years, and there's not a lot of re not a lot written about this, but over the years we found, they have found that it actually is causing some big problems. Um, accidents, people are just passing out uh, during the day after having taken Ambien. Um, so uh, this happened to my mother. Her doctor said, no problem taking it. Maybe she'd take a pill or half a pill or whatever she needed. And again, that was commonly prescribed, may still be. Um, but with my mom, she uh, had a couple of instances where she almost passed out. Thank goodness people were around and got her to sit down. But during the evening one night, if she went to the bathroom, came back, she, she passed out and ended up in the hospital. So we found out from that experience from the neurologist is the one that told us that Ambien was probably the culprit. We took her off of it. We put her on an antidepressant instead. She's sleeping like a baby and she hasn't fallen um, or passed out since we did that. 
most sleep medications are meant for the short term, not for long term use, which my mom was using Ambien for years. So just know you might need them just to kick back in to a cycle. Sometimes you just need them for a, a couple of days till you get back into the sleep cycle, but don't use them on a daily basis. Two great resources for you, the Sleep Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. If you search for Brain Basics, Understanding Sleep, they've got some great information. All right, I wanna take your questions and then I'll finish with my final quote. If anyone has questions, now is the time to type them into the question box. And I did get some questions. So you can see what the question box looks like and just type that in and send it to, to everyone and we'll be able to see your question. Um, I did get a couple of questions from just you know, just um, telling people about uh, the webinar and um, I wanna share some of my thoughts on that. Meanwhile, feel free to type in any questions you have uh, regarding sleep. So one comment that I got from someone who's uh, in the MSA, Multiple System Atrophy uh, Caregivers uh, websites, is that uh, this person knows that there's some of the people there on that online website communicating with each other are communicating after 11 at night. So um, he was really worried about their, be, their being able to get enough sleep and have their sanity. So I know that um, oftentimes that may be the only time you have, but if you can work your loved one into a better sleep cycle, so they're going to bed 10 o'clock or so, you might be able to get your own time from 10 to 11 or even get them to bed by nine. So think about how you can, can work their time schedule. Um, I see Lisa's asking about many doctors recommend taking me melatonin. Yes, and, um, and that's probably a safe one to take. And it's just a hormone. And melatonin, um, though, just know that melatonin isn't a drug that's going to keep you asleep. It's the drug you take to fall asleep. So it's not something that uh, will help you if you wake up in the middle of the night. It is something for those people that struggle with um, falling asleep. Uh, again, if you have any other questions, please type them in. I had another one that I got beforehand from folks. Um, and they were talking about their husband getting out of bed on their own to go to the bathroom at night, but she was worried because he can't walk without falling and asked if I had any suggestions. So uh, this happens with some neurological disease like the disease my husband had or PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, can happen with other neurological diseases and certainly could happen with some with arthritis and other issues that may cause them not to be steady on their feet. So the thing I was thinking about to, to help with this um, might be a second too late, but it'll be at least uh, before they get down the hallway is they do make, and you can look on Amazon, they do make mats that you can put on the floor. So wherever their feet would land, when they hit that mat, something rings. So um, that could be something that could help. And at least you could sleep uh, without worrying that they're gonna get up because you know that, that that bell is gonna ring if they do get up. So that's something to try and ask your therapist and your doctor for other, uh, seems like there's a couple of others I've heard about, but they're not, it's not dawning on me right now. And maybe if you go to um, Amazon, you can find some other things that could work. So Lisa's saying, my husband wears a condom catheter to avoid having to get up to go to the bathroom. He has PSP and that has worked for him and me. Yeah. So for men, the condom catheter um, it's just what, like I said, it's a condom that goes on him and then has a tube that goes to a bag. So we use this for about a year. And like I said, Charles hated it, but um, he just, it just was uncomfortable for him. And uh, at least I don't know if this has happened to you, but there were a couple of nights where there was a hole in the condom. So it didn't really, you know, so we had a couple, a couple of oopses. Um, but yes, condom catheters can really help if your if your husband is a significant other is okay with that. Try it. Uh, Cindy says, when loved one gets up every two hours to use restroom, but needs your help to go through the process, how to get back to sleep and get quality 
sleep it by the morning. All right, so a couple of things that let me just um, summarize that we've already talked about. One is have them stop drinking, you know, right after dinner, maybe. Make sure they're getting plenty of liquids during the day if you're going to do that, though. And then that may help uh, with the urinary thing. Um, the other thing is try all the other tech, make sure all those other techniques I've given you are in place with the sleep schedule, the darkness, the room, blah, blah, blah. And then getting back to sleep, I would try some of those distraction things like stop thinking. Try those to get back to sleep. Um, I used to take Benadryl a lot, and I find now that I can go back to sleep when I try some of those techniques. There are a couple of nights where I am so keyed up for whatever reason that I can't, but most nights I can, especially if I stick with those distractions. Uh, I just keep going, even if I get off, and then I keep going back to it. Uh, Lisa says, we've had a few malfunctions as well. <laughs> Sometimes it comes loose. Yeah, that also happened. And as long as you have a, a little pad under them for the, the real oopses, uh, that, that can work. A urinal is our lifesaver, Julie says. Yeah, sometimes just having the urinal handy, um, like that bedside commode or a urinal is something that, so you don't have to take that time to go down to the bathroom and back. You make it real quick and get back to sleep. My heart goes out to you all because I know this is hard. This is exactly what I went through. It is just very hard um, to be able to sleep with a loved one that <clears throat> is keeping you up or just with the, the heaviness of what you're dealing with. But I hope as you go back, now you'll get the recording for this. I hope as you go back and review your notes and review the slides again, that you'll pick a couple of things that you're really going to try and see if it works and give it, give it all some time to start working. I don't see any other questions, so I'm gonna continue on then. Um, just to wrap up, this is our next web webinar, how to, to boost your immune system in February, February 9th. So watch for the announcement that's coming up and the registration will be in the next uh, email that you get from me after uh, this webinar, probably tomorrow or the next day. Um, oh, some of you know, but not everybody knows that I have a YouTube channel, a YouTube station, and it's free. And all of my recorded webinars for the last, I don't know, four or five years or more are there on all kinds of topics. I've got one on holiday stress, which might be a good one if you haven't heard it to listen before the holidays come. So um, there's some on uh, guilt and all kinds of things. So you might want to take a look there. And my, the YouTube station, this is what, this is, you'll see, if you type my name in the search, you'll get many other things that I've done, but this is the one you're looking for, which is my channel. And then you can uh, scour and see some of the topics. Again, I just want to mention my books are available, Amazon, your bookstore. And I want to finish with this quote from Ariana Huffington. Um, being sleep deprived almost blinded her when she fell asleep at work and hit her eye on her desk. Quote, I studied. I met with medical doctors, scientists, and I'm here to tell you that the way to a more productive, more inspired, more joyful life is getting enough sleep, end quote. So I really, my fingers are crossed that you've picked up some tips that might help you get that extra sleep that you need, that those good nights, most nights, maybe not all nights, but most nights. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you. Watch for the recording. Feel free to share the recording with anybody that you want, whether they're caregivers or not. And I wish you a good night tonight. Take care and my heart goes out to all of you. Bye-bye.